I've gotten so many insightful comments on the video where I analyzed if normal monsters were actually stronger than effect monsters, and I have to admit that I was wrong. Sort of. I stand by what I said in the video as far as in reference to GOAT format, but that time scale is fundamentally flawed. A more nuanced approach focusing on how normal monsters were introduced into the game would have been much better than the aggregate approach which I used. For starters, the first five sets introduced the majority of normal monsters, and as you might expect from early sets, they were pretty weak. But it begs the question, how do they look in the context of the cumulative card pool at that point? I'm going to be taking a look at the evolution of normal monsters in the core sets for the most part. Tournament packs have a lot of weaker OCG imports as normal monsters, with one major exception I will be pointing out when we get there. I'm going to be showing the best monsters in terms of stats within their respective brackets, those being 0 tributes, 1 tribute, and 2 tributes. So starting with LOB, we have Skull Red Bird with 1550 attack points, the highest in its bracket. The highest defense points in the bracket is 2000, with cards like Mystical Elf and Aquamador. But surprisingly, both of these monsters are surpassed by the Giant Soldier of Stone, which also has 2000 defense points, but has more attack points. I stand by my evaluation that the Giant Soldier of Stone is so strong for no reason. I have sincerely debated labeling the card as a design mistake. In the one tribute bracket, the highest attack points are on Succubus Knight, with a whopping 1650 attack points, a full 100 more than the Skull Red Bird, and totally worth that tribute. In this bracket, there's not a single one tribute monster which exceeds 2000 defense points, so there's no reason to tribute set. I told you, the normal monsters start off very weak. Next in the two tribute bracket is the mighty blue eyes white dragon, whose attack points have never been surpassed by another normal monster. Blue eyes also has the most defense points for a two tribute monster, at least in this set. Moving on to starter deck Yugi and Kaiba, we see what is arguably power creep. I do want to point out that even normal monsters are incomparables to a degree. Characteristics with a capital C is a term I use to cover attribute type, fusion material status, and archetype inclusion. I recognize that unique combinations of these characteristics makes direct comparisons more difficult. So this video is admittedly a simplification. Star Deck Kaiba introduces Lodge in the Mystical Genie of the Lamp, which sets a new record for syllable count but more importantly, increases the attack power ceiling for the zero tribute bracket to 1800. Lajin actually has a stat total of 2800, and though Aquamador and especially Giant Soldier of Stone have higher total stats, I want to point out how Mystic Horseman technically has a higher stat total than Lajin, by a massive 50 points, but this type of generalist monsters are not good in actual gameplay. Generalist monsters, or those which do not fully commit to either attack or defense, are not as strong as the specialist monsters which do so. So I will not be mentioning them for the most part. Star Deck Yugi introduces Neo the Magic Swordsman, which is 1700 attack points but is outclassed on release by La Jin. I wanted to mention this because I actually think that the stat progression of normal monsters in the TCG is, to put it technically, completely out of whack where there could have been a much more gradual increase in attack points over several sets. The poster child for this problem has to be the Summon Skull though, also introduced in Star Deck Yugi. This monster has 2500 attack points, compared to the 1650 with Succubus Knight. La Jin and the other strong level 4 monsters which were introduced in these Star Decks had already invalidated the 1 tribute beat sticks from LOB, but the Summon Skull is a jump of 750 attack points. For reference, Judge Man, with 2200 attack points, would have been an okay monster since it could get over those level 4 walls, but is completely invalidated by the Summon Skull. When not paying much attention to characteristics outside of stats, Summon Skull eats up so much design space where again, there could have been a more gradual increase in attack points each set. This card is a massive power spike, and I'm not sure how I feel about it being introduced so early into the game. I mean, the card has the same attack points as Dark Magician, the ultimate wizard in terms of attack and defense. Moving on to Metal Raiders, we see a couple new cards introduced, like Illusionist Faceless Mage in the one tribute bracket, which finally surpasses the 2000 defense point monsters, and Seven Colored Fish, which is another 1800 point attacker, 
this time a fish instead of a fiend. I think this is worth mentioning, because those characteristics do help to differentiate what would otherwise be functional redundancy. This is the normal monster video, so I'm not going to be spending too much time on this, but I think it's worth mentioning that Dark Elf and Jirai Gumo are in this set as well. Dark Elf has 2000 attack points and 800 defense points, making it the reverse of Mystical Elf in terms of stats. These monsters surpass La Jin and even future normal beat sticks up until the printing of Gene Warped Warwolf. Do note that Dark Elf and Jirai Gumo do come with a downside, but not one that I think is too costly. There is also the argument of being able to summon Dark Elf and never attack, having it as a wall in attack position. Jirai Gumo has a similar function in the meta, with 2200 attack points and notably a steeper cost for attacking, if you're not lucky at least. These early high attack monsters with downsides do not entirely invalidate the design space occupied by the vanilla beatsticks, but they definitely infringe upon it in my opinion. Moving on to the first tournament pack, we see the power ceiling for zero tribute monsters rise again with Mechanical Chaser. Those 50 attack points really matter, as the early metagame became centralized around the Mechanical Chaser. This is that one exception in tournament packs that I mentioned earlier. Moving on to the next booster, we have Spell Ruler, which has one outstanding normal monster in particular, that being Labyrinth Wall. This one tribute monster has 3000 defense points, which is actually the most defense points for normal monsters at this point. There will also be Neo Aquamador and Soul of the Duelist much later, but that is a couple years in the future at this point. For now, I'm going to be skipping Pharaoh Servant and moving directly onto Labyrinth of Nightmare. The most significant inclusion in the set is Gemini Elf, which raises the power ceiling for level 4 normal monsters to 1900 attack points, which will be a hard limit for quite some time. Yes, future sets include more 1900 attack point beat sticks, but it seems we have reached the DM era power ceiling, and we are only one year into the history of the game at this point. This is why my previous video is so far off, because the entirety of normal monster progression was front loaded in the first few sets, and once ceilings were reached, it was hard to surpass them, effectively exhausting the relevant design space for normal monsters. So what changed in the set design, and how did normal monsters evolve from this point onward? Well, for one thing, the number of normal monsters in each set has been toned down considerably. From one half of LOB to about a third of Metal Raiders to about a quarter in Labyrinth of Nightmare. The number of normal monster inclusions has been steadily dropping in each set, where it would stabilize to about 5-10% to of the set, at which point set numbers go from 100 to 60 cards and the fraction raises to about 1 12th normal monsters per set. But that is neither here nor there. What is more interesting to me is the new direction taken in designing normal monsters. This will be mostly highlights from this point out, but keep in mind there is still chaff among the wheat. Legacy of Darkness introduces Opticlops, a generalist monster, but with a very high stat total on a level 4. Warrior Digrepher is similar, still a generalist monster, but this card is super significant in the game's lore. Then there is also the Dragon Dwelling in the Cave which has the same stats as the Giant Soldier of Strong, but this time on a dragon. There is also Robo Yaro and Robo Lady, which have the distinction of being pretty unique fusion materials, since they can fuse together to make either Super Robo Yaro or Super Robo Lady, which can even tag out into one another, two mechanics way ahead of their time for the record. Veronic Guardian offers Shape Snatch which needs no introduction to the impact of this gem of a card. There is also Master Kianchi, which is the new strongest zombie monster, and Caboozles, which is the new strongest dinosaur, and actually saw competitive play alongside Sabersaurus and Dino Rabbit as a secondary rabbit target. Dark Crisis really raises the bar for a few different monster types. Ninken Dog is the new strongest beast warrior, Gaga Gigo is the new strongest reptile, and another amazing monster from a lore perspective. Archfiend Soldier is the new strongest fiend, although is not strictly better than Opticlops, since Opticlops has more defense points. But being an Archfiend is a big plus. Going in another direction, Ojama Green is part of the Ojama card series, which eventually elevates these normal monsters. There is also DD Trainer, a very strong level 1 wall, although it is introduced in the same set as Battle Footballer, 
which finally raises that defensive power ceiling, at least in the zero tribute slot, with 2100 defense points. It's a little weird to think that this card came out the set before Soul Tiger, though, since Battle Footballer has more attack points, but the two cards are not quite comparable since they differ in a few key characteristics. Invasion of Chaos introduces the other two Ojamas. Now all three can be brought together to make something happen, specifically Ojama Delta Hurricane. I love the foreshadowing that spans these two sets, and I think it's an amazing use of the flavor text. As far as new beatstick monsters, Neobug is the new strongest insect, Sea Serpent Warrior of Darkness, the new strongest sea serpent, Blazing Apache, the new strongest pyro, and Mad Dog of Darkness, the new strongest beast. And in terms of raw stats, an upgrade over Gemini Elf. Then, if we turn our attention to the one tribute slot, there is an interesting development. Summon Skull really did eat up a lot of design space. So I've been neglecting talking about other one tribute beater monsters, like Amphibious Beast or Terror King Salmon. But Giga Gaga Gigo is a bit different, and not just for the lore progression. This card can be normal summoned under a legendary ocean, without a tribute. Then, can even attack over Summon Skull after the field spell's attack boost kicks in. Ancient Sanctuary continues the high batting average with some actually meta-normal monsters. Namely, Metal Armored Bug, which has been used in Demise OTK decks specifically to be used with Advanced Ritual Art, and Mystic Shineball, which is still worth considering today when used in combination with the Agent of Creation Venus. These cards together offer a lot of board presence for minimal cost. Also in this set is Sealmaster Masai, who has a spell and trap support card which can turn off traps and spells respectively. Not exactly better than Jinzo or Spell Counselor, but an interesting use of a normal monster. Hypothetically, a talisman of monster ceiling on effect monsters would be pretty good though. Then there is the Warrior of Zira, which has interesting integration of mechanics and lore, tying in with the two field spells. And on the topic of lore cards, we have the Giga Gaga Gigo sequel with Go Giga Gaga Gigo and the prequel Gigabyte. Gigabyte in particular is part of a larger push for level 2 or lower monsters as it is printed alongside the trio of Fiend Scorpion, Pharaoh Servant, and Favronic Protector, which raise the attack power ceiling for level 2s. Finally, there is Moki Moki, who alongside some pretty recent support has a useful niche. Moving on to the Soul of the Duelist, there are four defensively minded normal monsters, a couple of which even raising the power ceiling. Charcoal and Patchy has 2100 defense on a level 1, Skulldog Maran has 50 more attack than the Giant Soldier of Stone, and is more lore, and Neo Aquamador becomes the best one tribute defensive option as it has more attack than the Labyrinth Wall. In Rise of Destiny, there is Bokoichi, which has a niche interaction with Dikoichi, for additional card draw, and Harpy Girl, a member of the Harpy archetype for what that is worth. And this is really showing a turning point in the design space. As the game is beginning to become more focused on specific synergies between cards, and especially so concerning archetypes. It might be weird to look back at old vanilla monsters and archetypes, like Zur, Knight of the Dark World, or Gladiator Beast Andal for example, since they lack the archetype's core mechanics those being the discard for benefit and tagging out respectively. What is funny to me is that things have sort of come full circle though, where Dark Worlds and Gladiator Beasts have the option for Rescue Rabbit or Unexpected Die. To complete the loop, modern Harpy decks strongly consider running the Vanilla Harpy Lady over one of the three retrains, or even the Cyber Harpy Lady for that matter. And Harpy Girl even gives the deck access to rank 2s as well, at least for the brave and foolhardy. This trend of questionable archetype inclusion continues into Flaming Eternity with Chusuke, the Mouse Fighter, as this card is part of the Monk series, but the design direction surrounding those cards is still not well defined even today. Also in this set is Insect Knight, which more or less replaces Neobug, although this is almost identical to the situation with Opticlops and Archfiend Soldier. Insect Knight actually did see some competitive success alongside both Neobug and Metal Armor Bug, specifically as part of those Demise OTK decks that I mentioned earlier. I think it's cool to look back at cards which might have been seen as functionally redundant, but 
could coexist in very specific circumstances. Our last set in the GOAT format is the Lost Millennium, with the first round of elemental hero monsters being the only normal monsters in the set. This is a natural continuation of the trend which we have seen before, and the end of the core sets included in the card pool for the GOAT format, which was the cutoff point for the previous video. But let's go a little further beyond. Cybernetic Revolution reshaped the identity of the game with one card, Cyber Dragon. But that card unfortunately overshadowed the next step in the evolution of normal monsters. The level 3 attack ceiling is raised to 1750 with Jerry Beans Man, with the previous strongest card being Sonic Duck. I'm going to go even further beyond and show off more of the highlights for the rest of the GX era, but I want to point out that there are entire sets from this point on completely devoid of normal monsters. Power of the Duelist introduces elemental hero Neos, which is a linchpin monster for the Neospatians. Sabersaurus is also printed, becoming the new strongest dinosaur. As mentioned earlier, Sabersaurus and Caboozles saw play in the same Dino Rabbit decks, very similar to how Neobug and Insect Knight were both in Demise OTK decks. I just love the symmetry. It rhymes, like poetry. Then. Strike of Neos again increases attack power ceilings, with Gene Warped Warwolf having 2,000 attack points on a level 4, and Frostosterus having 2,600 attack points on a level 6. Then there is also the generalist monster Spiral Sea Serpent, which is as close to replacing Blue Eyes as you can probably get, having a higher stat total, but not surpassing the legendary dragon in terms of attack points. That particular power ceiling seems to be a hard one. Tactical Evolution then doubles down on archetype normals, with Volcanic Rat being a card designed to work with Blaze Accelerator, Alien Shock Trooper, the new strongest reptile, and a good beater in Alien decks, not to mention another rabbit target, and Hunter Dragon, which is the new best target for Cyberdark decks. Tactical Evolution also introduces Gemini Monsters, which are sort of an alternate evolution to normal monsters, since they inherit some of their properties but are really just an awkward middle ground between normal and effect monsters that deserve their own video one day. Debuting in Gladiator's Assault is Cloudy and Smokeball, which, like the Mystic Shineballs, is a pretty ridiculous playmaker when used with Cloudy and Turbulence. Then, to close off the era, is the Phantom Darkness, which includes not only Gladiator Beast Andal, but also Atlantean Pikemen, way, way before Mermails were even a thing. I'm not going to overgeneralize and say that the design space for normal monsters was exhausted in the GX era, but I think the next real innovations came in the form of normal tuners, which have some intrinsic utility, and then much later, normal pendulum monsters, which like Gemini monsters, bend the rules. But I'm getting off topic. Putting everything together, I think I got off on the wrong foot as far as framing the strength of normal monsters. Indeed, upon release, the best normal monsters surpass the best effect monsters, at least those without downsides. The majority of weaker normal monsters were front-loaded into the first few sets, and were pretty unremarkable, which had a disproportionate impact on the data. I feel like a few power spike normal monsters really burned up a lot of design space for normal monsters prematurely, and I hear the OCG actually had a much smoother progression. As the game evolved, the design space of normal monsters was explored a little more thoroughly, and new sets helped round out the card pool, giving many types incrementally stronger normal monsters. A few normal monsters even ended up being resistant to power creep, largely due to archetype status or other synergies. There was definitely a lot of experimentation, even if that didn't necessarily translate into competitive success. That being said, strength is not everything even in the metagame. Sometimes getting beneath a certain threshold can be very valuable. Killer Needle is a prime example, as the card is the TCG's weakest level 4 normal insect type monster. That very specific combination of characteristics makes it the best target for Goki Pole, since it has the best chance of popping an opposing monster. Lower attack means that Goki Pole hits more targets. It could even be argued that the design space for level 4 normal insects has been expanded, since now there is a great niche for a zero attack monster fitting those characteristics. But then, Killer Needle would lose what makes it special. Although, there is one more dimension to normal monsters, 
which I have only mentioned in passing. Flavor text. Normal monsters have an air of mystique. Most of the time, it feels like the flavor text is exaggerating, like Killer Needle reading, A huge bee with exceptional strength that's particularly dangerous in a swarm. Exceptional strength, and yet it's still the weakest level 4 insect. I have had quite a few fans tell me that they wished effect monsters had flavor text, and I agree. There's a lot of room to explore the lore of the game, figuratively speaking, not on the actual cards though. The text is tiny already, and I can't imagine them making room for unnecessary text which does not affect gameplay. The anathema of the Japanese standard print size. At the end of the day, I think I was wrong to take the data in aggregate, and in doing so, I stripped away a lot of the nuance surrounding the progression of normal monsters in the early eras of the game. Because normal monsters really went through some radical transformation as Konami explored the design space. And, even if they didn't always hit the mark, you have to applaud the effort and creativity.